He's had seasons averaging over 120. Even in one of the formats, he was the seasonal high scorer. Took Miller. Can the Gold Coast captain come back and be the fantasy beast we know he is? Or is he clipped under a new coaching regime? He's number 40 in my 50 most relevant. There is a lot to discuss about him. It is so good to see you. Thank you so much for checking in on this episode. Joining me to talk about the fantasy fortunes of Took Miller in 2024, his fellow panelist, Kane. Mate, nice to be chatting with you. He's a fascinating player. What could happen this year feels like there are multiple avenues of what might be in 2024. Oh, MJ is one of the most respected and admired players in the competition. And from a fantasy perspective, we've all loved watching how he goes about it. He can score in every facet of the game. He can put together those big quarters of 40, 50 points and save a score. And um, I think he's been one guy that we feel like deserves to play finals, that his game would be awesome on the final stage. So under this new regime under Damien Hardwick, I think all eyes are on the Suns about what they're going to deliver because I think we feel like as a collective there's plenty to like there from the fantasy piece. Well, that's where it does get a little bit complicated. And I think that's the key to a guy like Tuk Miller today is what is that impact? How much from the past can we carry to 2024? How much are we projecting forward with the guys he's going to be playing with? Where do you want to start? Mate, it's a heap of stuff you've just given us right there. Let's look into his 2023 seasonal data, unpack that, and then hit some of those pathways that you've just unfolded for us. Last year, a 97.6 seasonal average in Supercoach means he's priced for us at a $545,500 price mark. A top score last year of 127 was one of just eight tons he gave us last year. They're a bit shy, though, of what he's given us before. A career-high score of 167. An average of 96.2 last year in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team means in those two formats, he's priced at 868000 in AF and just a touch under 890000 in DT. Seven tons last year. The top of those was a 120 while he's got a career-high score of 160 in those formats. We'll look at this 2023 and some legacy scoring of Tuke in a moment. But for those that have never really fully watched Tuke Miller play, he is just probably the heart and soul type player that at any footy club you love to have. Elite athlete, runs all day. Will find himself getting into space. Will look to run down an opposition team at any point in time, you always feel like given how much he's got feels like in his tank, he could pop up at any part of the ground, the forward pocket, the back pocket, in the contested moment, under a stoppage, right through to the outside. And then he uses the ball really, really well and puts his team on his back. He feels like the kind of player, Kane, that if you were to ever make it to the AFL level and you've got Tuke Miller standing alongside you, even though he's not the most imposing physical specimen you're ever going to see on a footy field. You do feel like he can stand a bit taller with a player of his statue sitting on and, you know, standing on right side you. Oh, MJ, he's just been unbelievable. Again, it's probably those guys that are set off the top. He deserves to be in the finals. He ticks all those boxes and um, absolutely he's admired for his work rate and ability to get around the ground. And from a fantasy point of view, all the things you mentioned, that's what makes him such a good scorer. There's no column he doesn't fill. There's no part of the game where you feel like he's going to be out of the action. It's very rare that you see him have a really quiet quarter. He's just consistent throughout the game and just builds so nicely. Looking back to last year, though, that's what jumps out, isn't it? Because the reason is at this point, you could argue good and bad. The thing that's probably positive looking at 24 is there is value there. 97 is not really what we've come to expect from a Tooth Miller. That's... That presents a lot of value based on what he's done in the past. I guess the negative, though, too, not only did he miss time, but some of these kids have really kicked on now. And I think that's the thing that jumps out massively for me. When you look at his best two seasons in 21 and 22, that was Raul and Anderson's second and third seasons in the competition. So Anderson's played, you know, 41 games across 21 and 22. Raul missed a few more because 2021 he was sidelined, only played the 12, but he played 22 in 2022. So that was, you know, they were getting games into them. They weren't the players they are now in 2024. And I think even though Tuke missed a bit of time in 2023, regardless of that, 
Rowan and Anderson were coming. They didn't need any more time of Took being out of the site. They were coming anyway, and they've all improved out of sight. You think about Rowan's inside game, and even his DT's got to the 90s. Anderson's just so consistent across both formats, triple-figure guy now. So that's that was their fourth season, MJ. They're here. They weren't a factor when Took was doing those monster years, particularly in 2021 when he, alongside Jack Steele, were the fantasy players of the season. They were incredible, particularly their back end of the years when they were nearly nudging 130 every given week post buy. So I think we have to caveat that when we look at Tuke Miller and we see the value that he's priced at based on last year, and what's clearly enticing is the history, isn't it? We go, hmm. this is a guy that's not just an M1, but he's fighting for the M1. He's fighting to be the first player you pick in a draft. That's where we have him. That's the regard that he's in. The hard thing is circumstances have changed. So as much as we know there's value based on past performance, what's fantasy all about? It's all about the future. It's all about projecting forward. Is this a good matchup I can cash in on? Is this the guy that takes the jump? And I think that's where it gets really, really fascinating from a conversation point of view is not only is two back and healthy, that's huge. Right. Rowan Anderson have arrived. We haven't even got to a Sam Flanders who was, you know, the league winner from a draft perspective in the back half of the year and also in salary cap. But we've also got a new coach mm-hmm. in Damien Hardwick, who, depending on the numbers you see, obviously it's incredibly successful from a footy point of view. But mm-hmm. as we delve into fantasy, sometimes there's been some big scorers, some Dustin Martin, some Taranto. There's been some Jaden Short who's been top of his line. But collectively as a team, they weren't known for being a fantasy scoring beast. So how does that weigh into a Tuke Miller and the other Suns in 2024? Yeah, it's a big question. And in a moment, I want to look through some of that data for us to be able to unpack. Is that myth or is that fact? Last year, from the games that he did play, an average of 96 in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team and an average of 97.6 in Supercoach. Seven AFL fantasy tons, one of them over 120, and eight super coach tons, two of them over 120. There was one score in super coach under 80 all year. That's an injury impacted game, which we'll talk about in a moment. Two in Dream Team and Fantasy, one of those. Also, that injury impacted game against North Melbourne. Before that injury hit, which ultimately cost him a three month span of missing footy. It was a lateral meniscus tear in his left knee, three months of footy pretty much out the door. Before that point in time, he was going at an average of 104.4 in AFL fantasy and 115 in super coach. Okay. In fact, really quite good. But like you said, Kane, people look at Took, they look back at that 2021, they look at that end of 2022 and go, I'm getting not just a top eight mid, I could be getting the number one scoring midfielder. And I think that's the conversation that needs to happen. Let's just come back to this midfield and then the coach, because I want to unpack that number a little bit. But you've mentioned Miller scoring really well, not just in a young team. I think we could politely say it was a pretty bad team too. And it's not the first. Will it be the only time that we see good endurance runners that get around the ground, support their defensive team, try to impact the scoreboard with an in and outside combination and who tackle. There's been history over a number of years, even in the past two or three years, not just past 10 years, where we see good players protect their team, score in all columns, and they become fantasy beasts in bad teams. And there are a couple of players that come to mind or parallels for you that you could kind of help coaches go, or maybe Took is more like that before we look at 2024 and beyond. Well, Laird was a guy in recent years, MJ, that had that sort of ability when Adelaide was really struggling, you know, especially in that COVID season and he had that midfield move. We've seen guys in the past like a Lockie Neal, and this is where it really is the eye test. And you can see Lockie Neal had a year at Freo when Fife went down. He was in the back pocket receiving from the kick in. Like a lot of the time where the opponent would just say, I'm happy for you to have it there. You know, we've got a game plan that's going to be able to cover for this. So often they are given a little bit of extra freedom that maybe they wouldn't normally get if it was in a team that was really competitive. Um, And also they wouldn't have the need to be wandering down to the back pocket. You'd rather keep them up around the middle of the ground to be creating a contest when that long kick does come down the line. So there's a little bit of, you know, 
they're the guy that needs the ball. Zach Merritt's done it in the past too, where it's just like, let's just get the ball in his hands at all costs, even if it means he's come so far up the ground to help out and move the ball. So sometimes these guys in the bad teams, they do get afforded luxuries that maybe some of the players in the best teams, that would be a tag. Or they don't have the desire or need to go to the back pocket to receive the ball. You know, you're not going to send a Dustin Martin when he was flying with that Richmond side to the back pocket to get a kick in. You want to keep him in the forward line where if he gets it there, he's going to create a score. So sometimes these guys like Tuke Miller, and he was just on fire that back end of the season. MJ. So while he was chasing the ball, what else was he meant to do at the same time? So my point there is though, it does inflate the numbers. And I think you do see that in the back half of that is he was flying through the first 10 games of 2021 and it was a 113 average. From round 11 onwards, it was 129. And I think that's the stuff that we often find is it's those purple patches that the end of the season comes and we go, oh my God, imagine if he starts the season the way he ended it. And nine times out of 10, you actually just end up realizing it was just a purple patch. And I think you saw that from Tuke uh, in 2022 when he dropped down to about a 110, 115 guy. And then, as you mentioned at the start of last year, he was a 105, 115 guy in those first five games before he went down with injury. I'm not going to judge him anything after that. His return game was Stuart Dew's last game as coach. And then he played the rest of the season under Stephen King as an interim coach. So let alone the three-month layoff that you mentioned. And we've seen a lot of guys be nowhere near a 90 coming back from injury. So for him to do a 90 after missing three months is insane. We've seen guys come back who are super players at their club and struggle to hit 80s. So that just speaks to the volume of professionalism he's got and how hard he works. But I think you have to look at it and go, what is the number? What is the expectation? We're getting him in a mid-90. Where do you see him going? And for me, I've probably got him pegged around that 103 to 107 mark at best in DT. And then again, we know if the team's winning, that super coach differential might be as high as 10 points for a guy like Tuke Miller, which would be really good, wouldn't it? If he's in the 115 range for super coach, maybe even higher if the team's winning. And I just glanced at in 2021 when he was on fire, what his win score average was compared to losses. He was 143 in seven wins and 112 in losses. So it just shows, doesn't it? If the team can get to 12, 13, 14 wins, which would have the Suns on the verge of finals, if not guaranteed, if they got to 14, yeah. Well, that's going to be huge in particular for those super coach averages. So for me, he feels a little bit more like an SD guy. That that volume of ball comes down a little bit, but the quality, the score involvements and the wins go up. Where do you see it just on the numbers wise at the moment? I know we're going to dive into teammates and coach. Yeah. But is that where you sort of thought he was trending maybe even before Damien Hardwick's arrival? Is that where you sort of had him pegged? looking at the 2023 data. 100%. I thought you nailed it around that commentary around this emerging young talent that is now through this midfield, this forward line that is almost fully formed and developed and the defensive line that you could probably say is still a little bit away from where they would like it to be, but everything is building and they've now just got another core of gun kids that have come through. We haven't even mentioned a Bailey Humphrey, who was a top 10 pick last year and for fantasy coaches was huge for us in the kind of that middle quarter, you know, second quarter of the season. So to me, I look at this team and go, the dependency on Took for this team to get to the next tier has to move beyond, regardless of coach, regardless of who's in and around this midfield, this team is now requiring Took to not just put them on the back and come and I'll take you for an eight-week, 10-week, 12-week, 16-week ride. It's going to be, I'll get you over the line in tough quarters and tough matches, not I'm going to take you there for a full season. There's an interesting conversation that's kind of gone through the fantasy community that I wouldn't say is a myth, but it's too easily swallowed by the community. And that is under Damian Hardwick, they don't deliver fantasy relevant players. That's bollocks. It's not true. Now, there are some areas of the ground that don't deliver fantasy conducive scoring for sure. That surge of Richmond that we really saw at its best from 2017 
probably to 2021. We saw it a bit in 2022 and very small glimpses in 2023. We know it's not conducive to a high mark game style. We know a lot of outside wingmen, high half forwards that don't get goal. We know that's not there. But if you look from 2017 to 2023 to say they don't give you fantasy scores, nonsense. 2017, Dustin Martin, arguably a unicorn season, but he did it under Dusty, under Damian Hardwick. 113 in AF and DT, 119 in Supercoach. The next three years, mid to high 90s in AF. And again, that's in a split half forward mid roll and 100, pretty much either flat or more in Supercoach the next three years. Dion Prestia in 2019, an average of 99 that season in AFL Fantasy, and there's some injury impact on some of those while he goes 102 in Supercoach. In 2020, goes 94.5 in AFL Fantasy, and in 2020 and 2022 in Supercoach, 90 plus. And then while it's only a small sample size of not even a dozen games, but in 2023, Tim Taranto goes 119 in fantasy and 115 in supercoach. So there is a world where you can score in the Damien Hardwick system and score well, not just to be a premium, but in Taranto and Dusty's case, top of the line, best score you could possibly get. So let's not just go, oh, it's Dimmer, he's out. This is where you've got to watch and observe an opening round, which we'll talk about in a moment, ultimately gives us a lot of freedom to be able to observe and look. However, there was one midfielder that did drastically see a fantasy drop in their scoring, and it was about 2017 onwards. I'm alluding to Trent Cotchen. Kane, are there parallels here? Guy that wins plenty of the footy, guy that does the hard and defensive stuff, leader of the club, and Dimmer looks to the leader to say, I need you to sacrifice and I need you to now just do the team thing, which means statistically you're going to struggle. Is there a world where we might see that happen for Dimmer and Took this year? Boring answer, MJ, possibly. I don't know. That it's Again, it's, he hasn't coached these guys before and that's what's so important about coaching is you get this player that's a unique player. They're all unique players, but what is the game plan that suits a Toot Miller? What is the role I can put him in? So it's not as simple as just, you know, rinse and repeat those old, old formulas. I know at Richmond, those were constantly developing and constantly adapting. But yeah, sure, Took's a great leader. He's a great player. Uh, but he's also a great ball winner. So it just depends, doesn't it? It depends on everything else in the team. And that's what makes those stats really, really hard is, well, maybe Dion Prestier averaged X under that Damien Hardwick system. But he hadn't coached Tim Taranto until last year and Tim was fine. You know, now it's going to be a Noah Anderson, a Rao, a Tuke Miller, a Flanders. So that's what is really interesting. Maybe for that Richmond crew, and it clearly worked from winning games, didn't it? They won games. The fantasy numbers weren't there for a lot of them, but they won games. Maybe this Gold Coast style is a point scoring style because he's got Raul Anderson, insert all these great guys that have shown they've got massive fantasy games. So that's the... That's the risk though, MJ, isn't it? That's the big risk because as good as round zero is going to be having a free look, all of those guys we've mentioned countless times in the midfield are all good enough in a one-off game to go 120 plus. Mm. The, the tricky part always is what do they do from round one and for the rest of the year when you picked him? No point just jumping on because he's had a 122 miller. Like he can do that. Is it the role? Is it the team? Again, like all, all these things, is he better than the other player that you overlooked? That's going to be the really, really tricky part. And uh, that's what makes the Suns really interesting is we actually just do not know. Could he be a Trent Cotchin 2.0? Possibly. Could yeah. he play more forward? Possibly. Um, we just don't know. I think the thing that I would say we do know is Tuke Miller doesn't have the same reliance to score fantasy points and win the ball in 2024 as he did in 2021. I, I can pretty confidently and categorically say that with the emergence of just Raul and Anderson, that is not the same requirement. So for me, that waves goodbye to the Uber premium midfield numbers. Where yeah. it gets interesting though is, can he provide enough value as a high 90s average and price that figure 
to be a player that's worth it. And I think that's where he gets borderline in DT. In Supercoach, I probably feel a little bit better because, as you mentioned, he can be a really clean player, a really contested player, a guy that gets on the outside and creates scores. So if you're confident that the Suns can play finals for the first time, I probably feel confident that Tuke Miller can have a 10-point positive differential to Supercoach, get to 115, and now we're talking about something that's really, really interesting. But the Richmond stuff and looking at what Dimmer did in the past, I think you can just go around in a circle with that. Yeah, I think can. you've really got to simplify it with what do you think Tuke Miller is going to do? Now, if the game plan changes massively, sure. But you're not going to know that even after round zero. I think no. the interesting thing is I look at the averages from last year team-wise. Port Adelaide had the lowest fantasy average as a team in the competition. They were over 200 points behind the top team, St. Kilda. Yet they still had enough points for Rosie, for Butters, for Houston. So it's not the be all and end all if your team is not a big fantasy scorer. Sometimes it just means that they do spread the load. You mm. look at a St. Kilda, there were some guys that were good. Obviously, a Marshall was incredible. Sinclair's really good. Uh, Manganin Miller had his moments and Steele had his moments. But it's not like you're going oh my God, they're so far and away because they're part of the best team. So Hmm. there's always guys that can carve out roles and be scorers. You highlighted it with the Damien Hardwick old teams. There was guys that were scorers, whether it was Dusty or Short. We know that Prestia was a scorer a lot of the time. Hmm. Unfortunately, it was just injury that cost him a few hundred point seasons. Basha Hooley was a superstar. And as I flagged, as recent as last year, he got Tim Taranto, who was a scorer. One ten, And he was a scorer. Yeah. So sometimes it's just about the cattle you've got and that's what we don't know. So I think the one thing I can probably take away from Tuke Miller and express to people is don't just be drawn to him because to, in 2021 and 2022, he was an Uber premium. I think it has changed a fair bit since then. It doesn't mean there's not value. Mm. I just probably don't, don't see the huge bounce back, not because Tuke's any less of a player, but because he's not needed to be the fantasy monopoly in that Gold Coast midfield. That's yeah, a good summary. So he plays opening round against the Tigers. Gosh, that's going to be spicy for Dimmer and a couple of his old players that he's coached. Then they play the Crows. It's the Dogs. They're on the bye at that point. Then it's the Giants. And then they go into the rest of their season before another bye at round 14. He's in an interesting spot because just the round prior, there's a player that's priced very similar to him that's probably getting a little bit more love and that's seen in the ownership percentages on the AFL fantasy at time of recording has their ownership percentages publicly available with that format being opened. I'm contrasting him at the moment to a Sam Walsh. Miller's got a better history. Walsh is a little bit younger, but within about 10,000 of each other across the formats and they're being viewed in similar lights too. High nineties guy that we've got confidence that can get us at least 10 points per game of value, but the ownership is big, 33% on time of recording in AF, 21% for Miller in Supercoach. Uh, not his Supercoach, for, for AFL Fantasy for Took. So to me, it's interesting what people are choosing to do with these guys in this early buy rounds that present a bit of value. Rids unpacked on the Tim Taranto episode about how you could approach premium type players in that spot. So to me, this opening round strategy, Miller, Walsh, players in this chunk really do become fascinating what people want to do in the preseason. Well, MJ, and it's fascinating too, right? We've been talking about Tuk Miller's 2021 numbers to no end. People are doing the same about Sam Walsh. And you could yeah. argue that circumstances have changed for him since then too. Cripps has re-emerged. Cher has come across. Hewitt's come across. Doherty's now in the midfield. So it is funny that probably because he's a younger player. He's had, he's been more injury impacted, I should say as well, since then that you go, gee, Sam Walsh just hasn't had a clean run of it since 2021, let alone the guys that have come in. But it's funny because we've just spent all this time saying that Tuke Miller's ceiling has been clipped by the emergence of other players. You could argue the very same thing with Walsh and Carlton because Chris wasn't playing ground low metal footy at all in 2021. He was struggling. And it's a credit to him that he got back up and firing and he's been a beast. Shera joined the club. Hewitt joined the club. And now a Doherty, who's a fantasy monster wherever you put him, mm. getting a bit of inside mid-time too. 
it's just an interesting contrast as we build through the preseason. We're putting Toot Miller in one basket, which I clearly have. I wonder what we'll see from Walsh as we build towards, you know, opening round. Where does he slot in? What do these other guys do? And how does that ownership percentage you've highlighted fluctuate over the next two months? Yeah, it's a really nice little curveball you've given us as we wrap up the episode. For me, a player like Took and the Suns, just in general, are a massive watch this preseason. Is it Miller that pops? Do we finally see Noah Anderson become the Uber? Is Will Powell the new Jaden Short and Basha Hooley? There is a lot that we will get to see. For me, I don't see him dropping value from what he's priced at. Um, I can convince like Kane. The 120 days are gone. System and style and coach regardless. The kids have emerged. It's no longer required to put him on the back. What he does in opening round fascinates me because that might just move a lot of the casual coaches either to him or from him. And the injuries and information we get over these next couple of weeks is really going to tell us a lot. Well, MJ, talking draft, let, before you get to what rounds you'd have him and all that. Where does he go in terms of Gold Coast midfielders? And I'll just go, I'll just give you an order of Raul Anderson and Miller. Where does okay. he sit for you? Happy to go one for DT, one for Supercoach, because we know, sure. I think in Raul's case, he definitely slants more the Supercoach Avenue with how much of a contested beast he is. Yep. But where does that even sit in your mind? Uh, I'd take. I'd still take Took first in Supercoach, um, and I would take Noah Anderson first in AF and DT. Um, I would then put Miller second in DT and Rao third in DT and AF. Jumping over to Supercoach, I would still happily put Noah Anderson at two and Rao at three. But I'm not as confident as I am in AF and DT. I feel like that could flip-flop really easily. And that, for me, probably does tend to be a bit more game stylish. You know what we might see. What about you? How are you prepared to rank these guys? I, I think I think Anderson and Miller across the board are pretty close. I would have Miller slightly ahead. The one I do think could jump in the super coach air is Rao. I yeah. just think he's so contested. There's actually no reason if they're winning more games that he couldn't be a 15 to 17 type of point differential. He's just so good in the contest. But they're probably when you're actually in the draft, they're probably only one to two rounds apart, even across the formats. And that's yeah. throwing in defenders, forwards and rucks. So I think that's the really fascinating thing. And we haven't even got to a Sam Flanders, who you could argue from a value point of view, well, he'll be in the 50. I'm pretty confident of that, MJ. But there in itself is a fascinating group of four that you're going to have to be dealing with. And I think a lot of coaches are going to have their pick and go, which one of these sons do I want? Like, I think they're all going to go in a bit of a flurry. So for me, I've probably got Miller in that M2 range. Now, he's probably more, for me, M2 to 3 as opposed to the M1, M2. I've probably just got him slightly more leaning in the back end of that group. That would have him probably going in around 6 is probably where you're sort of talking. There's a lot, maybe 5. There's a lot to like from the other lines that I feel like people will say, got to have this, got to have that whereas Miller might just fall into the, oh, I don't mind him, but if I can get a similar player the next round. So for me, it's probably around round six. Again, probably a slight bump for Supercoach, but we do know some other positions come into play in Supercoach with the weighting of that scoring system. Yeah, the dream spot would be to get two at M3, but I think if you're hoping to land him there, you're loading the dice potentially against you. So if you are on the bullish side of Took Miller, and, and there's narrative and reason for it, it's got to be at an M2. M1's too early. No one's going to attack him there. You're safe. But you, it's M2 if you're bullish. M3 is the dream. But you're probably only way you're getting it at M3 is you're going midfielder one, two, three rounds. And, and you're really exploiting that early and not trying to get a top-end ruck, one of the better defenders or early selection on a forward. That's probably the only way he's going inside the first four rounds for me is if you're really going hard on midfielders early. Yeah, I think so. Again, sixth round still has him in picked in the first sort of 50 to 60 picks in a yeah, 10-team team, 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 team league. So that's that's really, really interesting when you say, you know, if you're going to go hard in the mids, that's going to be a really fascinating balance, isn't it? What you're giving up to what might be there in that fifth, sixth round. Um, 
And that's what I think makes it so interesting is it's all about that projection of how much bounce back are you hoping for? Are you maybe a bit cool and think maybe he's just going to be what he is, which I do think is the floor. I feel mm. like if he's going with the guys that are in the high 90s, 100, you just jump all over him. But it only takes a preseason article or press conference and say he's on the half forward flank or he's going to be playing a role that maybe we don't expect for that all to change. But you just feel like when you're betting on Tuke Miller, you know you're betting on an absolute pro. No stone's going to be left unturned um, in getting the most out of himself. And gee whiz, if he was a forward, wouldn't that be an incredible luxury to have? I happily take that if it, if that dice lands our way. Gosh, maybe we should pray that thing in. We might need them, Kane. As always, a pleasure to be able to chat with you, fantasy footy and super coach. Took Miller's a fascinating player. You've done a fantastic job for us on this episode. Thank you, mate. If you want to go and read the accompanying article on this episode, you can. Both this for Took and every other player we've revealed so far in the 50 Most Relevant, you can find it at coachespanel.tv. In the description of this episode is where you can get in touch with us across social media. Make sure you've followed us. If you're on those, we are too. Give us a follow. Join the conversation with the community. Plenty of the Coaches Panel fans and followers are getting around the 50 Most Relevant, unpacking the nuances of what could be and what might might be. If you've followed us on the podcast that you're listening to this one right now, wherever that is, make sure you follow, leave a five-star rating and review. It takes you 30 seconds, but it's a nice, simple way of saying thank you to the Coaches Panel. Help others in the community discover the Coaches Panel. In about 30 seconds, I've got a clue for you about who's coming up as we get into the 30s. But if you do love the Coaches Panel, you are enjoying this content, you want to say thank you or get some extra content from us. Or you can do both with one thing, become a Patreon. For as little as $2 a month, you can join our Patreon supporter group. There's a bunch of different hidden groups and content access. You can get a whole heap of different articles and tiered rewards. And if you jump in at that breakout or premium tier, one of the rewards those tiers get is the audio podcast of the 50 most relevant a day early. So they are well ahead of you. In fact, if you get that premium tier level, you also get an exclusive episode that is a round review when the season gets moving. So it's not just the pre-season content you get, it's what you get year round from the coaches panel. So we're going to jump into the 30s tomorrow. The 40s are now done. Let's head into the 30s. Let's go breakout territory, shall we? Everybody loves a breakout. Last year, he gave us his career-high AFL fantasy score. And he's been giving us tons pretty much since day one. Last year, 116 in Supercoach. Sounds like a pretty good career-high score to me, doesn't it? Mm -mm. He did that the year before. So who is this breakout guy that in a line we're desperately looking and scampering to find how we can get the maximum return from a minimum amount of investment? This player could just be it. Joining me on the episode, Hef of the Keeper League pod. He is going to talk about this breakout candidate tomorrow on the 50 Most Relevant.